The Jay, a short story by Mark Twain. Animals talk to each other, of course. There can be no question about that, but I suppose there are very few people who can understand them. I never knew but one man who could. I knew he could, however, because he told me so himself. He was a middle-aged, simple-hearted miner who had lived in a lonely corner of California among the woods and mountains a good many years and had studied the ways of his only neighbors, the beasts and the birds, until he believed he could accurately translate any remark which they made. This was Jim Baker. According to Jim Baker, some animals have only a limited education and use only very simple words, and scarcely ever a comparison or a flowery figure, whereas certain other animals have a large vocabulary, a fine command of language, and a ready and fluent delivery. Consequently, these latter talk a great deal. They like it. They are conscious of their talent, and they enjoy showing off. Baker said that after long and careful observation, he had come to the conclusion that the Blue Jays were the best talkers he had found among birds and beasts. Said he, There's more to a Blue Jay than any other creature. He has got more moods and more different kinds of feelings than other creatures. And mind you, whatever a Blue Jay feels, he can put into language. And no mere com commonplace language either. But rattling out and out book talk. And bristling with metaphor too. Just bristling. And as for command of language, why, you never see a blue jay get stuck for a word. No man ever did. They just boil out of him. And another thing, I have noticed a good deal, and there's no bird or cow or anything that uses good grammar as a blue jay. You may say a cat uses good grammar. Well, a cat does. But you let a cat get excited once. You let a cat get to pullin' fur with another cat on a shed nights, and you'll hear grammar that will give you lockjaw. Ignorant people think it's the noise which fightin' cat make cats make that is so aggravatin', but it ain't so. It's the sickenin' grammar they use. Now I've never heard a jay use bad grammar, but very seldom, and when they do. They are as ashamed as a human. They shut right down and leave. You may call a jay a bird. Well, so he is in a measure, because he's got feathers on him, and don't belong to no church, perhaps. But otherwise, he is just as much a human as you be. And I'll tell you for why. A jay's gifts and instincts and feelings and interests cover the whole ground. A jay hasn't got any more principle than a congressman. A jay will lie. A jay will steal. A jay will deceive. A jay will betray. And four times out of five, a jay will go back on his solemnest promise. The sacredness of an obligation is a thing which you can't cram into no blue jay's head. Now, on top of all this, there's another thing. A jay can outswear any gentleman in the mines. You think a cat can swear? Well, a cat can. But you give a blue jay a subject that calls for his reserve powers, and where is your cat? Don't talk to me. I know too much about this thing. And there's yet another thing. In the one little particular of scolding, just good, clean, out-and-out -out scolding, a blue jay can lay over anything, human or divine, Yes, sir, a jay is everything that a man is. A jay can cry, a jay can laugh, a jay can feel shame, a jay can reason and plan and discuss. A jay likes gossip and scandal, a jay has got a sense of humor. A jay knows when he is an ass just as well as you do, maybe better. If a jay ain't human, he'd better take in his sign, that's all. Now. I'm going to tell you a perfectly true fact about some blue jays. When I first begun to understand jay language correctly, there was a little incident happened here. Seven years ago, the last man in this region but me moved away. There stands his house, been empty ever since. A log house with a plank roof, just one big room and no more.
no ceiling, nothing between the rafters and the floor. Well, one Sunday morning, I was sitting out here in front of my cabin with my cat, taking the sun and looking at the blue hills and listening to the leaves rustling so lonely in the trees and thinking of the home away yonder in the States that I hadn't heard from in thirteen years when a blue jay lit on that house with an acorn in his mouth and says, Hello, I reckon I've struck something. When he spoke, the acorn dropped out of his mouth and rolled down the roof, of course, but he didn't care. His mind was all on one thing he had struck. It was a knot hole in the roof. He cocked his head to one side, shut one eye, and put the other one to the hole, like a possum looking down a jug. Then he glanced up with his bright eyes, gave a wink or two with his wings, which signifies gratification, you understand, and says, It looks like a hole. It's located like a hole. Blamed if I don't believe it is a hole. Then he cocked his head down and took another look. He glances up perfectly joyful this time, winks his wings and his tail both, and says, Oh, no, this ain't no fat thing, I reckon. If I ain't in luck, why, it's a perfectly elegant hole. So he flew down, got that acorn, fetched it up, and dropped it in, and was just tilting his head back with the heavenliest smile on his face, when all of a sudden he was paralyzed into a listening attitude, and that smile faded gradually out of his countenance like breath off a razor and the queerest look of surprise took its place. Then he says, Why, I didn't hear it fall. He cocked his head at the hole again, and took a long look, raised up and shook his head, stepped round to the other side of the hole, and took another look from that side, shook his head again. He studied a while, then he just went into the details, walked round and round the hole, and spied into it from every point of the compass no use. Now he took a thinking attitude on the comb of the roof, and scratched the back of his head with his right foot a minute, and finally says, well, it's too many for me, that's certain. Must be a mighty long hole. However, I ain't got no time to fool around here. I got to tend to business. I reckon it's all right. Chance it, anyway. So he flew off, and fetched another acorn, and dropped it in and tried to flirt his eye to the hole quick enough to see what become of it. But he was too late. He held his eye there as much as a minute. Then he raised up and sighed, and said, Consound it! I don't seem to understand this thing, no way. However, I'll tackle her again. He fetched another acorn, and done his level best to see what become of it. But he couldn't. He says, Well, I never struck no such hole as this before. I'm of the opinion it's a totally new kind of hole. Then he began to get mad. He held in for a spell, walking up and down the comb of the roof and shaking his head and muttering to himself. But his feelings got the upper hand of him presently, and he broke loose and cursed himself black in the face. I never see a bird take on so about a little thing. When he got through, he walks to the hole and looks in again for half a minute. Then he says, Well, you're a long hole, and a deep hole, and a mighty singular hole altogether. But I've started in to fill you, and I'm darned if I don't fill you, if it takes a hundred year. And with that, away he went. You never see a bird work so since you was born. He laid into his work, and the way he hove acorns into that hole for about two an hours and a half was one of the most exciting and astonishing spectacles I ever struck. He never stopped to take a look any more. He just hove them in and went for more. Well, at last, he could hardly flop his wings, he was so tuckered out. He comes a-drooping down once more, sweating like an ice pitcher, drops his acorn in and says, now, I guess I've got the bulge on you by this time. So he bent down for a look. If you'll believe me, when his head come up again, he was just pale with rage. He says, 
I've shoveled acorns enough in there to keep the family thirty years, and if I can see a sign of one of them, I wish I may land in a museum with a belly full of sawdust in two minutes. He just had strength enough to crawl up into the comb and lean his back agin the chimney, and then he collected his impressions and begun to free his mind. I see in a second that what I had mistook for profanity in the mines was only just the rudiments, as you may say. Another jay was going by and heard him doing his devotions and stopped to inquire what, as, what was up. The sufferer told him the whole circumstance and says, Now yonder's the hole, and if you don't believe me, go and look for yourself. So this fellow went and looked and comes back and says, How many did you say you put in there? Not less than two tons, says the sufferer. The other jay went and looked again. He couldn't seem to make it out. So he raised a yell, and three more jays come. They all examined the hole. They all made the sufferer tell it over again. Then they all discussed it, and got off as many leather-headed opinions about it as an average crowd of humans could have done. They called in more jays. Then more and more, till pretty soon this whole region appeared to have a blue flush about it. There must have been five thousand of them, and such another jawing and disputing and ripping and cussing you never heard. Every jay in the whole lot put his eye to the hole and delivered a more chuckle-headed opinion about the mystery than the jay that went there before him. They examined the house all over, too. The door was standing half open, and at last one old jay happened to go and light on it and look in. Of course, that knocked the mystery galley west in a second. There lay the acorns scattered all over the floor. He flopped his wings and raised a whoop. Come here, he says, come here, everybody. Hanged if this fool hasn't been trying to fill up a house with acorns. They all came a swooping down like a blue cloud, and as each fellow lit on the door and took a glance, the whole absurdity of the contract that the first jay had tackled hit him home, and he fell over backwards, suffocating with laughter, and the next jay took his place and done the same. Well, sir, they roosted round here on the housetop and the trees for an hour, and guffawed over that thing like human beings. Tain't no use to tell me a blue jay hasn't got a sense of humor, because I know better. And memory, too. They brought jays here from all over the United States to look down that hole every summer for three years. Other birds, too. And they could all see the point, except an owl that come from Nova Scotia to visit the Yosemite, and he took this thing in on his way back. He said he couldn't see anything funny in it, but then he was a good deal disappointed about Yosemite, too.